Istanbul's Hagia Sophia will be converted from a museum to a mosque. Thanks for joining us for Plain English lesson number 281. I'm Jeff. JR is the producer, and you can find the full lesson at plainenglish.com slash 281. The full lesson includes the transcripts, the video, one additional word we call learn the lingo, exercises, and so much more. So that's all at plainenglish.com slash 281. On today's lesson, Turkey's president has converted the Hagia Sophia, an iconic museum, into a mosque. We'll talk about the decision and the history of this building in today's lesson. Our expression is a tiny sliver, and we have a song of the week. Let's get going. The Hagia Sophia is one of the architectural jewels of Istanbul, Turkey's largest city, which sits at the crossroads of the eastern and western worlds. It was first built as a cathedral for the state church of the Roman Empire between the years of 532 and 537, back when the city was known as Constantinople. That makes it about 1,500 years old. It is one of the world's best surviving examples of Byzantine architecture and is known for its enormous dome and the surrounding minarets, which were added by the Ottomans. The Hagia Sophia has a rich history. In fact, the site was a religious site even before the current structure was built. Two previous churches dating back to 346 stood on the same ground. The structure that exists today was built by the Roman Empire and served as a Catholic church for over 900 years. In fact, during that time, it was the world's largest church. That all changed when Ottoman Sultan Mehmet II conquered Constantinople in 1453. The Ottomans turned the Hagia Sophia into a mosque, and it remained a mosque for almost 500 years. In 1935, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the founder of modern Turkey, transformed the building into a museum in keeping with his vision of Turkey as a secular republic. Although most of Turkey's inhabitants were and are adherents of Islam, Ataturk wanted a modern republic that would be separate from religion, as is the case in many European countries. And for that reason, Ataturk converted Istanbul's most famous building into a museum. That decision has been reversed. A Turkish court said that Ataturk's 1935 decision to make the Hagia Sophia a museum had been unlawful. Just hours later, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan reconverted the building into a mosque. The Hagia Sophia began religious prayers on July 24th. Though many are concerned about the decision, supporters say that the building will remain open 
to all. Even after becoming a mosque, Erdogan said, the Hagia Sophia will remain open to visitors, including non-Muslims and tourists. The Hagia Sophia's minarets have sounded Muslim calls to prayer every afternoon since 2013. A small room has been dedicated to prayer for the museum staff for years, and Muslims have prayed outside the Hagia Sophia, imploring the government to reconvert it. The decision is seen by opponents as more evidence that Turkey is moving away from its roots as a secular republic. In their view, this is just one more step that Turkey is taking toward becoming an Islamic state rather than a secular state. Opponents also said that the decision is a sign of disrespect to the country's current and future religious minorities. Surveys show over 90% of Turkey's 83 million people are Muslim, only a tiny sliver of the population practices any religion other than Islam. The international reaction was broadly against the move. The EU said it will fuel mistrust and promote new divisions. Pope Francis and ministers from France, Greece, and Russia condemned the move. Many of Erdogan's religious supporters welcomed the move. They believe the building should be restored to its rightful place as a religious site, which it was for its entire history prior to 1935, and as a mosque as it was for half a millennium. They believe that the Hagia Sophia as a religious site is a symbol of Turkey's Muslim heritage and its cultural strength. They also point out that there are dozens of churches in the immediate area of the Hagia Sophia, evidence that Turkey remains a tolerant country. There is another view, a more cynical view. Many Turks believe this is political showmanship by Erdogan. His approval ratings have slid in recent years, and his political party suffered a stinging rebuke in municipal elections two years ago. Erdogan's party lost the major offices of the country's two largest cities, Istanbul, and Ankara, the capital. His public support has been fading, especially during the coronavirus. Many Turks believe this move is a way of distracting the country from the poor economy. Many people believe this is a politically motivated move to shore up support among his more conservative religious supporters. In a recent survey, a majority of people said they thought the decision was made either to divert attention from the economy or to help the government's chances of surviving the next election. Fewer than 30% thought It was born of a genuine desire to make the building a mosque. I have been to the Hagia Sophia. It is a beautiful building up close and inside with a beautiful gold interior, detailed inscriptions on the dome and the walls, It's a stunning building, and the fact that it has been there since 537 
is incredible. That is probably the oldest building I have ever seen, I think. Just to put this in perspective, the Sistine Chapel opened in 1508, so that's 1,000 years younger than the Hagia Sophia. Notre Dame Cathedral opened in 1345, still 800 years younger than the Hagia Sophia. Those of you who live in that old Roman Empire slash Ottoman Empire area, you have some rich, rich history. If you live in Turkey, you can enjoy plain English in a whole new way with our instant Turkish translations. On our transcripts, we highlight 100 words or phrases in blue And if you hover over the words in blue, you can see the translation from English to Turkish. Our first episode like that was Monday. So now there are four in our last Monday. So now there are four in our growing library of English lessons with Turkish translations. If you speak Turkish and want to be among the first to enjoy our new Turkish translations, then please visit plainenglish.com slash join, J-O-I-N, and pick either the starter or the plus membership. Today's expression is a tiny sliver. A sliver, according to the definition is a long, slender piece or a narrow portion. If someone offers you a piece of cake at a birthday party, you might say you just want a sliver, just a tiny piece, the narrowest piece you can cut with a knife. Sometimes I say I just want a sliver, but I hope They cut a big piece by accident. That's not how I used it in today's lesson. I said that Christians are a tiny sliver of the population in Turkey. So picture a pie chart. A pie chart is a graphic, a circle, a circular graphic that shows you percentages. We've all seen one. If the pie chart shows you 50% are one thing, 50% are another thing, the chart will be divided down the middle. When we want to say something is a very small percentage, we say that it is a tiny sliver. Why do we say that? Because we want our listeners or our readers to picture a pie chart in their minds, and we want them to picture the tiniest little piece of the pie chart depicting our subject. Christians in Turkey. There are about 200,000 to 300,000 of them. This is in a country of 83 million people. They make up less than one half of 1% of the population. Among people who follow a religion in Turkey, about 98% are Muslim. About 1% say they are spiritual but not religious. Two-tenths of a percent said they were Christian, and the rest said they were another religion. Two-tenths of a percent said they were Christian. What does that pie chart look like? The pie chart is almost entirely Muslim and then a few tiny slivers. Spiritual but non-religious, other, and Christian are each 1% or less of the pie. They are just a tiny sliver. So we can say that only a tiny sliver of the population 
is Christian. Of course, this was but one survey, and there are many ways of framing the question. This survey, for example, didn't include people who said they were not religious at all. But you get the point. A small percentage is said to be a tiny sliver. Here in the U.S., Muslims are a tiny sliver of the population, about one percent. A tiny sliver of our population is Buddhist too, about seven tenths of one percent of the population. What percentage of the population is left-handed? Any lefties out there? If so, you know that the world is built for right-handed people. If you're left-handed, you have company. About nine to ten percent of the world's population is left-handed. You might feel that you're in a small minority, but I'm sorry to say that does not count as a tiny sliver. Ten percent of a big birthday cake is not a small portion. About one percent of the population, however, is ambidextrous. That means they neither favor their left hand nor their right hand. They truly can use one just as well as the other. Just one percent, a tiny sliver of the population, is ambidextrous. You'll notice. That all my examples are about a population, usually people, but it can be animals too. The important thing is that we almost always use a tiny sliver when talking about a small minority of people. You would not say a tiny sliver of these products is defective. That doesn't work because it's talking about an object. You have to talk about a population. Gluten-free products are popular here. Many restaurants have gluten-free menus. Gluten is a group of proteins found in wheat and wheat products. Bread, beer, pancakes, the batter covering fried chicken. All that has gluten. A tiny sliver of the population cannot digest gluten. They have celiac disease. Eating gluten, eating bread, will make them sick. But it's a tiny sliver of the population. A lot of people have decided to. Eliminate gluten from their diets because it makes them feel better, or they think it's a healthier choice. That's why so many restaurants have gluten-free menus. It's a nice option for people who truly have the disease, but they are only a tiny sliver of the population. Most restaurants could not afford to offer a special menu. For just a tiny sliver of the population with celiac disease, but they can offer it to the much larger population of people who don't eat gluten for other reasons. Today's song of the week is "Golden Age of Radio" by Josh Ritter. In these lyrics, he describes life on the outskirts of Memphis, a medium-sized city, and he touches on some dissatisfaction with that life, a desire to leave, also a sense that he's not fitting in. One of the lines is, "Which way did our last chance go?" And can we still get out if we go now? It's a feeling of being left behind in a place that he doesn't belong, 
but you also hear him hint at some nostalgia, too. He's of two minds in this song. I like it. Golden Age of Radio by Josh Ritter. There's an album of the same name where you can hear the live acoustic version of his song, too. That is all today. I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. If you're in Turkey, perhaps in Istanbul, let me know what you think about this issue. We have our new Facebook group just for plain English listeners. I'd love to hear what you think about this topic. If you think it should be converted into a mosque, or if it should remain a museum, or if it's not a big deal, let me know in our new Facebook group, plainenglish.com slash Facebook. It's also easy to find us on Facebook. Just search Plain English. If you land on our business page, there's a big link that says visit group, and that's how you find the group. Have a great weekend, and we'll be back on Monday with another Plain English lesson. Music